Lord, that is our prayer that your spirit will just speak to our hearts and lives. Challenge us, encourage us. Lord, I pray as we look at this story of a blind man that you will just give us vision, spiritual vision, that we might see you even clearer, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So in my younger years, if you read my devotional this week, you already saw this a little bit, but, but in my younger years, I enjoyed really, really good eyesight. I mean, I used to boast about how far down the road I could read the signs and nobody else could read them, you know? But uh, I had definitely 20-20 vision or better. Do they, can you get better in 20-20? I don't know. But then uh, about the time I turned 40, this strange phenomenon started happening. I began to notice is that as I read my Bible, as I read books, that the words started looking a little fuzzy. And so I would hold it back a little further, and back a little further, and I noticed Rex is doing this too these days. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, my arm wasn't long enough anymore. So I went to the uh, drugstore and bought a pair of uh, reading glasses. Next year, I went back and bought a stronger pair of reading glasses. And the next year, a stronger pair. And then, then I got kind of tired of, I don't know if I dare do this with my, anyway, got kind of tired of taking my glasses off and on during, while I preached. So I decided I'd go to the uh, eye doctor and uh, make an, uh, have an eye exam and get some reading glasses. And he pre- definitely prescribed some reading glasses, uh, bifocals. Uh, so the, gla- the top of the glasses were clear glass because I could still see real clearly at a distance, but I had prescription glasses on the bottom. Went back a couple more years later and I uh, got a new prescription. This time there were, there were prescriptions on both the bottom and the top. And the next year I went back again and they were stronger and this went on and went on, and I still go back every couple of years, and they keep adjusting, and they get a little bit stronger all the time. But uh, that's just kind of something that happens when you turn 40, I guess. You start losing your, your eyesight. But can you imagine what it would be like if you had been born blind without any ability to see at all? You couldn't see the people that you lived with, You couldn't experience the beauty of a sunset or a rainbow or the beauty of an ocean. The words red and yellow and green and purple would be absolutely meaningless to you. You had no idea what those would would look like. Well, today in our Encounters with Jesus series, we are going to take a look at John chapter 9, Jesus' encounter with a blind man. You know, of all the miracles that Jesus performed, he actually gave sight to the blind more than any other kind of miracle. Why? I think it's because physical sight or physical blindness is often used as an analogy of of spiritual vision, spiritual blindness or sight. And no passage makes that analogy more clear than this one in John chapter 9 as Jesus contrasts the blindness of the of the Jewish religious leaders with the enlightenment of this healed blind man. We're gonna break it down into actually four encounters. The first of all is the blind man's encounter with Jesus, his first encounter, and then he encounters the Pharisees, and then he has a second encounter with Jesus, followed by Jesus' encounter with Pharisees. So we're gonna just kinda walk our way through this narrative and and then stop after each encounter and just make a couple of uh, of uh, applications and points. So first of all, the blind man's encounter with Jesus, verses one through 12. Let's look at it and read it and we'll come back and discuss it. As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man born blind from birth. His disciples uh, asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. No one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, 
Isn't this the man who used to sit and, and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, nah, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, well, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. Of course he said, I don't know. He didn't see him, right? The beginning. So, starts off in verse 2, and it simply tells us that as, as he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man born blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In ancient Jerusalem, uh, disabled people customarily claimed spots along a well-traveled road that led to the temple. Um, and, and the street was literally lined with beggars, some lame, some deaf, some who couldn't speak, uh, some who couldn't see the blind. Uh, the, this man ha- had been was one of those men who, who kind of had their spot lined out on that street up to the temple. And so he could be seen on a regular basis with his beggar's cup and a blind man's cane, perhaps. Well, Jesus saw the man before the man was interested in him. And Jesus had compassion on him. Quite a contrast with the disciples. The disciples were simply curious about the man's disability. And so they ask, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? You see, their question is actually a, a pretty common understanding of disease in ancient Judaism. It was commonly believed that, uh, that disease and affliction was, was a direct result of someone's sin, either his sin or, since he was born from blind, perhaps the sin of his parents. Unfortunately, that's actually still a common view today. We don't actually verbalize it much, but we kind of have it in the back of our minds, don't we? We believe that that goodness brings God's blessing and sin or evil brings God's penalty or judgment. We kind of have that in the back of our mind, don't we? And so when things bad happen, we kind of think, well, is God judging me? So let me ask you, are, are my bad knees a judgment from God? I'd like to think not. Maybe, is there some hidden sin in my life? Well, the truth is that I injured the one that I, I saved. The, I, you know, I've had four surgeries in the last two years. Um, well, this will be the fourth. So I saved the worst one to the last. This one I actually injured 15 years ago. Kind of blew my knee out playing racquetball. I used to play racquetball two or three times uh, a week. And uh, racquetball, if you know anything about it, is, is one of the roughest sports there is on knees. A lot of stopping and twisting and turning, and it's just really bad. So is racquetball a sin? Maybe playing two or three times a week is a sin. No, neither one. Sometimes life just happens. And it's not really a direct result uh, tied back to any particular sin. A lot of parents actually ask this question as well. When they have a child who is born with a physical disability, did I do something wrong? What happened? Did we sin? Is God judging us? Or, or, or why didn't God heal in this case? Well, Jesus says, answers the disciples' question in verse 3. He says, neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And so Jesus is very clear. Blindness... This man's affliction was not caused either by his sin or by his parents' sin. Yeah, it's a result of sin, a result of sin in general, because all disease is actually a result of sin, going back to um, the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Sin impacted all of creation. So disease is a part of that, a result of sin in the Garden of Eden, the curse of God. And so, yeah, sometimes the truth is that affliction is caused by our own sin. For instance, drunk driving can result in some pretty bad things. Sometimes disabilities can even be caused by a parent's sin. For instance, when a baby is born, a crack baby is born, it's a result of the parent's sin in the past. But usually, no one specifically 
is at fault for human tragedy. No one is to blame. Life just happens. Disease, sorrow, and suffering are just a part of our human condition in a sinful world that we live. So um, God didn't cause this man's affliction. Jesus stated very clearly that it was done so that God can be glorified through it. Ultimately, God wants to be glorified through everything, through all of our weaknesses, through all of our afflictions, through all of our diseases. God wants to be glorified. A lot of what glorifies God really is, is our attitude through it all as well. But even through the, the tough times, even through our weaknesses, God can be glorified. Well, in verses 4 through 5, Jesus went on to say that while he was in the world, he was the light of the world. In other words, Jesus came to bring, bring light to all mankind. And he symbolizes this by giving sight to this particular blind man. So in verses 6 through 7, we read, having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and put it on the man's eye. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. I don't think that would pass health codes today, would it? But anyway, that's what he did. Why, why mud? Why not just touch him? Or just speak a, a healing word to him? Why did he spit on the ground and make some mud out of saliva and put it on the man's eyes? I don't know. Bible doesn't tell us why. Jesus used a lot of different methods in healing. He's, he's pretty creative, you know. And, and so I, I really don't know. I don't know if this is symbolic, but, but he, afterward he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam is a, a pool that's actually inside, a pool of fresh water inside the city walls that is fed from a, chan, from a spring in the Kidron Valley that runs through a channel that was built hundreds of years earlier probably during King Hezekiah's time, uh, to, to bring some fresh water within the city, um, city gates so that if perchance an army were to surround the city and put it under siege, they still had access to fresh water. And so he, Jesus told this man to go wash in this pool, this pool of Siloam. And the next few verses describe then the reaction. Well, he went and he washed, right? Now let me ask you, what if he had not gone to the pool of Siloam and washed and he just took the mud off? Would he have been healed? No, he wouldn't have been. What if he had washed in a different pool? What if he'd gone the other way and washed in the pool of Bethesda? Would he have been healed? No, he wouldn't have been healed. You see, by washing in the pool of Siloam and doing exactly as Jesus said, he demonstrated his faith and it's his faith that healed him. Now the next few verses then describe the reaction of his neighbors and his friends. Is, is this really the blind man? Is this the guy that we saw along the streets of the temple? Is this really him? Well, some people said, well, it kind of looks like him, but nah, it couldn't be him. He was blind. And he came to his own defense and said, I'm the guy. I once was blind, but now I can see. Two points I want to make from this blind man's encounter his first encounter with Jesus. The first point is this. We are all born blind. Spiritually blind. Every one of us is born spiritually blind. We may not be physically blind, but we are spiritually blind from birth. We are born in sin. We are born with a sin nature. It's part of our DNA. It comes from our parents and their parents and their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. And so this sin that, that we have in our life that's inherent in us blinds us to spiritual truth. Jesus, though, is the light of the world. And only Jesus can heal spiritual blindness through the enlightenment that comes through the Holy Spirit. The second point would simply be this. The path to spiritual sight is faith. Just as the blind man had to do exactly what Jesus said in order to receive his sight, so we too have to exercise faith in Jesus Christ. Our blind hearts are only healed through faith, faith in Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to God. There is no other way. And so our spiritual blindness, our spiritual blind hearts are healed only through faith in Jesus Christ. 
That brings us then to this blind man's encounter with the Pharisees in verses 13 through 34. Let's just kind of walk our way through these. Starting in verses 13, 14, it says, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. These Pharisees are the religious leaders in, in Jerusalem there. Now, on, now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Ooh. Jesus broke the Sabbath rules. Jesus and the blind man both broke the Sabbath rules. First of all, healing was considered work in a violation of the Sabbath. Oh, yeah, you could heal if it was a matter of life and death, but if it wasn't a matter of life and death, then it had to wait till the next day. Well, blindness was not a matter of life and death, and Jesus healed on the Sabbath. He broke the Sabbath rules, their Sabbath rules, not God's Sabbath rules. Secondly, uh, the blind man went for a walk, and you can only walk so far on the Sabbath day, and I don't know how far the Pool of Siloam was, but it was likely may have been a little further than the Sabbath day's walk. We don't know for sure, but they broke some Sabbath rules. So the Pharisees were kind of upset. Of course, they were already kind of mad at Jesus. But in verse 15, it says, Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Now this meeting with the Pharisees is not some nice, congenial, congratulatory meeting. He's walking into an inquisition here. The Pharisees are doing everything they can to entrap Jesus. They wanted this man to give them some, some fuel for the fire so they could accuse and, and arrest Jesus. But the man responded by simply sticking with the facts. Well, he put mud on my eyes, I washed, and now I can see. It's as clear as day. So verse 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. The first time we see a division amongst the Pharisees concerning Jesus' identity. Some condemned Jesus because he broke the Sabbath. Of course, they had been condemning him for quite a while because of breaking Sabbath rules. But others questioned how a sinner could do such miracles. I wonder, the Bible doesn't say this, but I just wonder if it might have been Nicodemus who stood up for Jesus again as he did in John chapter seven. Very likely, very possible. Verse 17 goes on and says, finally they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened, the man replied. He's a prophet. See, the Pharisees wanted the blind man to kind of settle their dispute, give them some uh, fuel for accusing Jesus, but he simply responded, he's a prophet. A prophet being one who speaks for God, and many prophets did miracles as well. And so he responds, he is a prophet. Verses 18 through 24, the Pharisees kind of gave up on this guy, and so they, they, they knew his family, so they called his parents in to see if they could get some, uh, some fuel from them to accuse Jesus. So they asked his, his parents if he was their son. They said, yeah, and, and yes, indeed, he was born blind. And they asked him, well, so, so how, can they, how can he now see? And they refused to answer the question. They said, ask him. He's a grown man. He can speak for himself. Ask him. They, what, what was really happening here is they were afraid that if they were to speak up for Jesus that they would be excommunicated from the synagogue. That's basically what it says there. So in verse 24, we read a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. They say, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. Do you think they were concerned about glorifying God? If they were concerned about glorifying God, they would have simply said, wow, this guy can see, praise God, right? But no, they didn't say that. Uh, again, they're just seeing, uh, they're just looking for the, some reason to charge Jesus. Verse 25, the blind man replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Kind of reminds me of a song, doesn't it? What song does that remind you of? What song? Amazing Grace? Right there, right? 
I once was blind, but now I see. Uh, Again, he doesn't get into a theological debate at all. He sticks with the facts. And only the facts. I once was blind, but now I can see. Verses 26 and 27, they asked again how he was healed, looking for anything they could pin on Jesus. And the blind man simply responded, I I already told you. Then then he added a question. Why? Do you want to become his disciples? I'm not sure how they took that, but I don't think they took that too well. They definitely did not want to become Jesus' disciples. So I don't know if the blind man was kind of using a little sarcasm here or or kind of a jab in in their side. I I don't know. But uh, they didn't take too well to that. And so they began in verses 28 and, and 29, they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where, they, where he comes from. When all else fails, you do two things. You start throwing insults at people, and you start doing these power plays. You pull rank on the other guy. And they do both. They start throwing insults at him. And they're getting angrier and angry. And so they pull rank on this guy. We are disciples of Moses. In other words, we know the Torah inside and out, forward and back. How dare you talk to us about prophets and about sinners and so forth and so on. When all else fails, pull rank. It's usually an admission of defeat when someone starts quoting from their resume in the middle of a debate, or, or it's even clearer when, they, when the person resorts to the use of power or the use of rank in order to silence their opponent. And, and so they kind of see here that they have been defeated. I love verses 30 through 33. The man goes a little further than just the facts this time. The blind man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from? Yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this, were not, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Their power play didn't work at all. In fact, it backfired on them. It emboldened this blind man. And, and you know, at the beginning of the Inquisition, he, he just kind of maintained a neutral stance and, and stuck to the facts. By the end, the Pharisees' absurd quest to discredit Jesus pushed him toward belief, and, and, and he actually schools the Pharisees here, doesn't he? He's got to be from God. He cured. He healed. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. A couple observations here before we go on in this encounter with the Pharisees. What a stark contrast between the blind man and the Pharisees. The blind man received his physical sight, and he could see clearly. He had 20-20 vision both physically and spiritually now. While the enlightened Pharisees, enlightened Pharisees, the ones who could see, the disciples of Moses, they remained spiritually blind. These are religious leaders who knew their Bible, their Old Testament, their Torah. They knew it better than anyone. They have been trained in Jewish history and theology and tradition and, and, and they kept the law to the letter of the law. They, they built fences around the law so they wouldn't even come close to breaking the law. But their spiritual pride blinded them to the truth that is standing right in front of them. They just couldn't see the truth. You know, it kind of makes me wonder how many Christians sitting, or how many people, shall I say, some even Christians, sitting in churches today are spiritually blind. Oh, we know the Bible. We know theology. 
We know all the do's and don'ts and we do live this perfect little life, right? We have all the pat answers. But are we blind? Well, that leads to the blind man's second encounter with Jesus in verses 35 through 38. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when they found him, he said, or when he found him, when Jesus found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Word travels fast, doesn't it? This man had been expelled from the synagogue. He'd been thrown out, excommunicated. And so Jesus begins to search for him. And he finds him. You know what? Jesus is still in the search and find business today. He's still searching sinners all the time to bring them, to draw them to himself. But he asked this man, do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man is is a title for for the Christ or the Messiah. Do you believe in Messiah? And the man responds positively, but then asked to see Messiah. And so Jesus says, you have now seen him. He's right in front of you. In other words, I am the Messiah. In verse 38, how does the man respond? The man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And the word worship here is the word proskuneo, the same word used in John chapter four with the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. Um, But this word proskuneo comes from the root meaning to bow or to kneel. In fact, it literally means to kiss the ground. Uh, It carries the idea of reverence or awe, surrender, submission, bowing before someone who is my superior, like subject would bow before a king, a lord, or a master. And so when it says he worshiped, it doesn't mean he started singing or he started dancing, although he may have done some of that too on his way back home, I don't know. But it literally means he bowed before Jesus. He humbly acknowledged Jesus as his lord, as his, as his master. So he kneels before him, bows before him in surrender, in submission, in reverence and respect to Jesus. A key point in this man's second encounter with Jesus is simply this. The man's physical eyes were opened immediately, but did you notice that his spiritual eyes were opened gradually? Did you see the progression in this man's perspective on Jesus throughout this chapter? Verse 11. Uh, When his neighbors were asking him how he was healed, he said, the man they call Jesus. In other words, he he knew his name, but he really didn't know much more than that about him. He just knew he was a man, and he had the name Jesus. Verse 17, when when the Pharisees were, were inquiring of him, impressing him, he said, he's a prophet. In other words, he recognizes that now that he's more than just a mere man, he's not just a normal man, he's a prophet, someone sent from God. Verses 32 through 33, still talking to the Pharisees, he says, he is from God. He's not a sinner, he's one who is from God. Only someone from God, he says, could give sight to the blind. And now in verses 35 through 38, he says he is the Son of Man, he is the Messiah. He acknowledges him and he believes in Jesus as the Messiah. I share that because I want to just encourage you, as you witness to people today, don't expect them to always trust Jesus immediately. It doesn't happen the first time you share the gospel with them. It's usually a process, a process of growth. Yes, even growth as an unbeliever. In fact, it may take several encounters with the gospel before people today trust Jesus, especially in our culture today where we are so anti-Christian. And so it may take several hearings of the gospel, may even take several hearings from several different people before they respond to Jesus Christ. So don't give up. Don't give up. 
Remember, it's a process of coming and coming to faith. And that brings us to Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees in verses 39 through 41. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Now some Pharisees who were with him, so he's talking to the blind man here, but there's some Pharisees there with him, heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Are you talking about us? Jesus said, if you're blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So apparently some Pharisees are with the blind man when he met Jesus the second time. And Jesus simply said that he came so the blind would see and those who claim to see will become blind. And they knew immediately that he was referring to them. So they asked, are you claiming we're blind? And the way that he, they asked in the Greek language here suggests that they were expecting a negative response. They were expecting Jesus to say, no, 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 of course not. You're, you're not blind. But Jesus didn't play along, did he? Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. A little bit of a paradoxical statement there. Jesus says, those who are spiritually blind don't see their own sinfulness and their need for a savior. But people who have spiritual sight, well, they readily admit their sinfulness and their need for a savior as this man did. In other words, you're blind. You're still spiritually blind. The Pharisees had physical sight, but they were spiritually blind. The blind man was once physically blind, but now he can see clearly, both physically and spiritually. You know, there are a lot of people in our world today who are blind and don't even know it. Both in the world around us, but even in the church today. When I say the church, I'm not talking about North Mountain. None of you are blind. But in the church as a whole. Could be some of you too. I don't know. So I want to ask the question. I want to just close by asking the question. What is it that causes this spiritual blindness? First of all, what causes this spiritual blindness in the world? Well, we know what causes blindness in the world, don't we? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 makes it very clear. It says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So ultimately, it is Satan who blinds the hearts and minds of unbelievers in the world. But he uses a lot of different tools, a lot of different things, strategies to blind people today. He might use the American ideal. You know, this pursuit of happiness. This pursuit of the almighty dollar that we think is going to bring happiness. Pursuit of wealth and possessions can be very blinding spiritually. He uses worldly philosophies today. Propagated by philosophers and even scientists today in in our culture. Science is good, don't get me wrong, okay? Okay. But not everything that we call science today is truthful and good. And worldly philosophy, philosophies like humanism that teach man is supreme, those worldly philosophies are very blinding. And people who just kind of grow up in it, fed through our education system today, this philosophy, well, they end up becoming very spiritually blind. Satan also uses worldly success, power, Position, success, blinds us to spiritual truth. Oh, we've got it made. We don't need God. We, we, we can handle life for ourselves. We've we got it all figured out, right? Spiritual blindness. And you can name many other things as well, but ultimately it's Satan who blinds the hearts and souls of unbelievers. But what is it that causes spiritual blindness in the church? I'm afraid there's a lot of spiritual blindness in the church today. See, just knowing the Bible does not give you 2020 spiritual vision. You might know all about the Bible. You might know all the, the facts. You might know it as well as the, relig- the Pharisees of Jesus' day knew the Bible. But the Bible says knowledge puffs up. First Corinthians. Pride. Spiritual pride is very 
blinding, even to Christians. Legalism is another thing that will cause spiritual blindness. You know, having this form of external righteousness, following all these do's and don'ts, and I don't do this and I do that, and, and, and so I've got the, this Christian life down pat externally. But that is very blinding because it results in a spiritual pride that blinds us, our hearts and our souls. Or might even be tradition. Some churches' traditions are held up higher than Scripture. Very blinding. Hypocrisy. You know, always thinking that we have to maintain the, this air of, of spirituality. You know, we have to come to church and, and, and make everybody think there's nothing wrong in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm just got everything together, right? Well, that hypocrisy leads to blindness. Or it might just simply be deep-rooted sins or addictions or bad habits. They, too, can lead to spiritual blindness. Lots of different things. So let me just ask you. How's your spiritual vision? Do you have 2020 vision? Or do you have some spiritual cataracts that are hampering your vision? Is there some sin in your life that needs rooted out or some spiritual pride that needs to be checked at the door? How's your vision today? I trust, I know you can see physically just fine. Can you see spiritually? Do you have 2020 spiritual vision? Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth, Lord. I just pray that you will challenge each one of us today, too. That, Lord, help us to just take a moment and examine our hearts and our lives. Lord, just may your spirit just reveal to us any spiritual blindnesses there, any causes of spiritual blindness that we might confess those to you and, and see clearly once again, see the, the truth of your word and the truth of Jesus Christ again in our lives. Lord, if there's anybody who doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I pray that today they, that, that the scales of their eyes of their heart might just fall off. They might see the truth that they need a Savior. Lord, we can't save ourselves. And so I just pray that if there's anybody that doesn't know you as Savior, that today they might just be drawn to Jesus and place their faith in Jesus Christ today, I pray. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And God bless you.